Sky. This is Sky. That was Molly. This is their roadmap to success. Um, so basically, uh, being uh, during the time of the coronavirus, we did the entire session outside. Um, and so the video above is going to cover how you can establish a visible boundary. I'd like you to do that in the house. Uh, like I said, the two, uh, a couple of the areas. So when you're in the kitchen, they, one of the rules is they should not be allowed in the kitchen when you're preparing food. Only when you're preparing food. The rest of them they can come and go as they please, but not when you're preparing food. Um, also around the kitchen table, seven foot boundary. Remember the dog? If a dog's within seven feet of you when you have a high value item like a food, that's a way of challenging. And if one dog is there, I promise the other, other dog's gonna try to challenge as well. And then we create a situation where the dogs are kind of competing to challenge. And that's kind of a negative association. That's not what we want them to do. We want them to be competing to be obedient and things like that. So um, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about what's in the video above because we already did that, but we did it out here, but I want you to do it inside. Uh, now, and also when you have the grandkids come over, have them help you out. Now, it'd be easier for you to do this for one dog at a time, but have the grandkid come over and eat, you know, some uh, macaroni and cheese or some goldfish or whatever it is in a chair and then practice and uh, enforce that visible boundary. Now, if you can, pick and choose your battles. Try to find an area where you can see right there the deck goes from planks this way to planks that way. So if you have an area where like there's a room uh, or the dog, uh, the child is eating at the table in the kitchen and the, it goes from uh, vinyl or lam laminate flooring to wood or carpet, well, that's where the line is. That's It's easy to uh, for the dog to see what it is and for you to see what it is. So try to look for natural or uh, the landmarks that come in with your house based on the layout of your house and the uh, design elements that you have in place. Okay, so the um, first thing we talked about was exercise because both dogs... Um, uh, especially Sky here is a really, uh, she's a Weimaraner, she's very athletic. Um, Molly is not, she's a Dane, and Danes are traditionally kind of uh, easy dogs, uh, but uh, they both have probably more energy than they need. And so we talked a little bit about exercising, a couple of things that we can do for exercise. One of them is what I call a doggy stairmaster, which is having the dog go up and down the stairs. Now the way I do it, Sky. Is let's say we're at the top of the stairs. I show Sky that I have a treat and I throw the treat at the bottom of the stairs. When she licks it up, I would say like Jamaica. And so the treat goes to the mouth first, not just for this, for any exercise. Treat always goes to the mouth, then they hear the command word and only the command word. Not good, good job Sky or sit or a good sit, just sit. So I show Sky that I have the treat. I throw it down there. She goes to the bottom of the stairs. I say Jamaica, then I call her to the top of the stairs. And when she gets to the top of the stairs, I give her another one I call it Canada or Denver. So now I've created a command word that goes down the stairs, a command word to go up the stairs. So what I want to do is with an empty stomach with each dog, I want to practice throwing them up and down the stairs, each down up is one. And I would keep on throwing them until Sky's like, you're crazy, I've been down there 78 times, I'm not going down there anymore. We want to find out what the maximum number is. That's why we do it with an empty stomach when they're nice and hungry. And then Sky goes away and then we practice with Molly. And so we want to figure their number is going to be probably very different. I'm probably guessing that about twice the numbers for uh, uh, um, for Sky than for Molly. So basically, once we know what that maximum number is, we can exercise the dogs usually about 50 to 75 percent of that maximum number multiple times a day. Now, exercise or lack of exercise is a multiplier. Um, it's going to either multiply and amplify the problems you have, or getting more exercise will make it easier to fix those particular problems. So, um, if you're going to have your grandkids come over, the dog should be exercised first. Um, if uh, if you're going to have a construction person coming by to work on something, maybe uh, we exercise the dogs before that, um, before dinner, or you know, it's a time that they would normally challenge you for something. Setting them up for success. Uh, is a great way, to, uh, great strategy. And so uh, the doggy stairmaster is one of them. The, the guardians do a good job of walking the dogs, but right now one of the dogs, uh, Sky wants to pull everywhere, Molly wants to kind of uh, go back home. So they're kind of getting pulled in other directions. So I think Sky is going to take our loose leash walking class, which we're going to start this weekend, which will actually uh, help tremendously because that way she's not all over the place. Now, um, Molly, I guess, wants to sniff everything, is what I forget. And so uh, for Sky, when you are walking Sky, exercising her before the walk can produce a much better walk. And then go ahead, go on the walk ahead of time, get yourself some fr finely shredded cheese, go on the path that you're going to walk on first. And then go, maybe if the sidewalk's here, sprinkle a little cheese for maybe about six inches on one side of this uh, of the sidewalk. Then go a couple houses and then sprinkle a little bit on the other side. So, and when you get to that area, kind of stop and tap with your foot nearby it. And eventually Sky will start, uh, and when she gets to it, licking it up. Dogs burn more energy in a walk by sniffing than they do from that locomotion of walking. And most of us, we have the wrong mindset. We want to get back to our house. So we're walking a circuit. 
And so we're gonna walk around these eight blocks and then anything that stops us from getting back to our house fast enough, we wanna kind of hurry the dog along. Well, that actually is gonna take away the thing that's burning the more energy. So uh, what we'd like to do instead is take the dog on a walk. If you got 20 minutes, say I'm gonna walk this direction for 10 minutes on this block. Well, we'll have many blocks you go. And then at my 10 minute mark, I cross the street and I turn around and come back. So we have fresh sniffs on the way back. You don't care about making completely a circuit, you just care about the duration. So now you just set your timer, 10 minutes this way, 10 minutes back. You might only make it four houses down the street. You don't care, because all you're looking for is the sniffs, not the walk. All right, so um, a couple other things that you can consider, uh, something we didn't talk about in the session, but you could get your dogs a doggy backpack. Um, a doggy backpack is like saddlebags for dogs. They should, and if you get one, make sure it's about 45 uh, to about 80 bucks or somewhere around there. Uh, Sky. Never say just the command word, not good coat, just not. Um, so if you get a doggy backpack, you put like a bottle of water or bags of sand or whatever in it. Now the dog has a job while they're on the walk. The, the extra weight also makes the walk a little bit more efficient. And so those are two things that you can do. Hey, Molly. Are those are two things you can do to make your walks a little bit more efficient. And again, we want to promote the sniffing as much as we can. Now, some other things we can do is using a snuffle mat. You can order those on Amazon. The gray one that I showed you in the video is the one I would recommend you order. Um, it's uh, basically um, uh, a little throw rug that has like tassels on it. You work, put their kibble on it. The dog has to work through all the tassels to get their food. So that makes eating almost like getting some exercise. It is exercise. It also is stimulating because they're using the nose to find it. It's relaxing for them because they do use their nose. So there's a lot of benefits that come from feeding out of a snuffle mat. I would definitely use one of those for Sky. Molly's kind of a lazy eater, and so we might not do it for Molly right away. It'd be nice to do it eventually because it's like I said, free, almost free exercise, uh, or it's exercise you get for the dog without you having to put that exercise in. Um, another thing you might want to get is an Omega Paw Treat Ball. Get the large. It's about the size of, an or, uh, of a uh, softball. And it's got little dimples on it. It looks a little bit like an orange golf ball. You can put kibble or treats in the sleeve in the little hole. The dog has to nudge it just right to get a couple pieces of kibble to come out. This is a nice thing to do when guests or somebody are here, so it gives the dog something to do. Now be careful if one dog has it, I can see Molly being a little possessive of it. So make sure you're having multiple, uh, maybe two of them, and one does it in one room, one does it in the other room. Wouldn't be ideal to do for guests with multiple dogs because of those issues, uh, but it is something that's distracting for them. I also give that card for the green spot. I would recommend you get a bag of bully sticks. Bully sticks, uh, the ones we get are from the well Natural Dog Company. You get them the green spot. They are low odor or odor free. Your nose will thank you for getting uh, paying a couple extra dollars to get the odor free ones. Um, so basically, um, uh, also my dogs love cow kneecaps. That's one of their favorite things. So if you have some stuff like this, when the kids come over or the grandkids come over or guests come over, if you exercise the dogs first, you set them up for success. You practice that technique of stepping on the leash at the door that I showed you. Let me talk about that real quick. So what you want to do is when you guys are coming home with each other or a family member or friends make it be on or in on it with you, uh, put Sky outside. I'd practice, I'd probably practice with both dogs, but Molly's a bigger jumper. So put Sky outside or somewhere else. Put uh, Molly on the leash, or you could tether the leash to that uh, staircase if it's strong enough to be able to support her. She's going to rip it out, but don't do it there. When you do it, make sure you're stepping on the end of the leash and keep your feet about shoulder width apart. Make sure you're wearing shoes. And size it up so that Molly can only get, even at the end of her leash, there's still about five feet inside your front door. So the idea is I'm standing on a leash, Molly's over there, the door's there, the guest comes in, the guest comes, walks up, so it's about two inches outside of Molly's reach and just turns sideways, Molly's right here. And Molly's like, please, Peppy, let, give me your attention. And the guest is not saying anything. The guest can talk to you two, but not saying anything to the dogs. What we're doing is we're using the leash as a tool. Now, eventually Molly, she'll probably protest and bark and grumble and all the rest of that stuff. Eventually her energy is gonna go down. As soon as her energy kind of calms down, the guest can now turn to face her. But as soon as the guest turns, she's going to start wiggling and get up until the guest turns sideways again and we step out of reach. So what we're saying is when you're calm, Molly, you're very attracted to us. We want to pet you. We start the process of trying to pet you. As soon as you get excited, that process stops and I turn to the side. And, out, and you'll have several back and forths. But eventually, Molly will learn to calm herself down and she'll start offering a sit or an LAY. Now, I don't tell her to sit or LAY for this. I just, all I care about is the energy is calm. So I would have your neighbors that live nearby come and practice this once we're done with coronavirus and you have people in your house. Um, and, but right now you can do it with each other. So when you're coming home, don't use the garage door. Park your car in the driveway 
or on the street and call or text one another, hey, let's do the door exercise. So we put the other dog outside, Sky's outside, Molly is on the leash, we step on the leash, and then we go and open the door. It's our partner. Our partner can keep letting themselves in, and we practice this. Now, they're really excited to see you too, so it's good practice for you guys as well. And after enough practice, the dog will learn, if I want the pet guest to pet me, I have to be calm and quiet and maybe sitting or laying down. And as soon as they do that, you do pet. And as soon as they stop doing that, you stop the pet. Okay, um, we, another tip that I want to go over is uh, leashing the dogs up. Now, this is going to get a really long video if I go through it all here. So what I want you to do is on my website, there's a search box. Search for Calm Leash. And there's a video, a number of videos of dogs that I've done this with. So the process, remember, is you're walking to where the leash is. The dog can't walk in front of you. Then when you get there, the dog has to sit. And once it sits, you start reaching for the leash. As soon as it gets up, you pull your arm back and tell the dog to sit. If it sits, you continue it, trying it again. If it doesn't sit within three seconds, the first time you say it, you walk away. And a trick to this is to practice leashing your dog up on times you're not planning on taking it for a walk. So now we uh, create, it's not always a guarantee of the walk every time we pull up the leash. All right, we also talked, uh, getting back to exercise, um, uh, uh, the other one that we talked about was scent games. Scent games is simply hiding treats around the house or a bait or a lure and the dog's gotta find them. Go to Google and just search for uh, scent games. There's a whole bunch of options out there that you can find. There's a lot of uh, cool things you can do and these are nice ways to drain the dog's energy. Remember, if your dogs are naughty, they're getting in trouble, they're barking, they're annoying your guests, ask yourself how long has it been since they've had exercise. If it's longer than an hour, they probably need some exercise. That doggy Stairmaster is genius. So I don't say, do say so myself, because you can do it so quickly and so efficiently. And you have a guest that comes over to watch a football game, and maybe you exercise them before, and now halftime comes and the dogs are all full of energy. Well, take them the stairs to that doggy Stairmaster. The grandkids coming over, the grandkids could throw those treats up and down the stairs with a little supervision. Eventually, they'll come over and say, hey, can I throw treats for the dogs? Yeah. So now the grandkids are helping chip in and putting the dogs in a position to succeed by burning off that excess energy. Okay, um, uh, we also talked about rules and the importance of rules. Most of us consider, think of rules as a negative and the person who enforces the rules being mean and a reward is a, uh, uh, breaking the rules is a reward. This happens because of how rules are introduced to us when we were a kid and we carry that perception for the rest of our life. But the fact of the matter is in the dog world, leaders are the ones who enforce rules. So if you don't have any rules for your dog, it can very quickly see you as a peer. And if it doesn't see you enforcing rules, you don't like seem to be acting like a leader, even more of a reason not to listen to you. So um, some of the rules that I incorporate are uh, uh, not being allowed, uh, like I said, within seven feet of the dinner table when we're eating, not allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food. Um, uh, let me see, I tell the dog it has to sit before I open the door. I go to the door and I say sit one time. If the dog doesn't sit within three seconds, I sit down in a nearby area. And then I ask Google or Siri for a one minute timer and then I check my phone or read a paper, watch TV or whatever it is, wait one minute. After one minute, go back to the door and command the dog to sit. They have three seconds to sit. If they don't sit within three seconds, the first and only time that I say it, when I walk away, this time I sit down for two minutes. Next time I sit down for four minutes and eight minutes. And set a timer each time because it'll go by too fast or not fast enough. And eventually, when you go to say sit, let's say Sky sits and, and uh, Molly doesn't, well, I open the door and let Sky out. So that gives Molly some motivation. Well, Sky listened to my humans, and then she got a benefit from that. Maybe I should think about listening to the humans. Molly's basically kind of a spoiled dog, and she doesn't have motivation. So it's going to be a lot of little lessons like that. Do the same sort of thing for uh, for uh, the leash. Go to the leash, tell her to sit. If she doesn't sit, then walk away. Or if she does sit, reach for the leash. If she gets up, pull your arm back down. I'd like you to go to a structured feeding. Remember, you guys would eat something first, just five bites of a chip or cracker is fine. And then basically, I would like to have you, if you have, I don't see the inside of the house because it's kind of coronavirus, but if you have kind of a choke point in your kitchen, like a small area that they can go in there, maybe put one bowl over here, one bowl on the other side of the kitchen, and the doorway is over there, then you're in the kitchen, and you're eating your five bites of chip or cracker. I would probably invite, uh, uh, I mean, just because she's so more exuberant about it, I would probably invite Sky in. When Sky's eating, Molly's not allowed to come in the room. She has to stay behind the invisible boundary, just like in the video that I showed you above. Um, and then once, um, uh, and I would feed her out of the snuffle mat because that'll burn some energy. Once Sky's done, then Sky has to vacate the kitchen, and her bowl is empty. And then we invite May in, uh, uh, Molly. Excuse me. Molly comes in, and Molly goes over and sniffs the bowl. 
I don't know if I'm very hungry. As soon as she walks away, we pick up her bowl, we dump it empty, and then we put the empty bowl back down. It's important to put the empty bowl back down. So, and we're not saying, encouraging her to eat over and over. She doesn't eat, the food goes away, and the kitchen is closed until the next meal. Now, uh, right now the gardens are feeding twice a day. I would probably switch it a little bit. Um, they're feeding, I think, a third of what the, uh, the portion in the breakfast, and then the other two thirds uh, for dinner. I would do feed the two thirds for breakfast because they need the fuel, the food as fuel throughout the day. And if they uh, eat only eat so much, then just feed them a little bit less for the next one. And sometimes when I have a dogs and I'm adjusting like this, I set it up so like, okay, you get dinner if you eat all your breakfast. If you only eat half of your breakfast, then the other half is what I would give you for dinner. And if you didn't eat anything, then you don't get any dinner at all. That makes them more hungry for breakfast the next day. A lot of dogs will get in the habit of eating late in the day. Late in the day, that's not as good for them as it is to eat earlier. Um, okay, and uh, make sure that you're eating something first so they see uh, you as the leader. But again, now I have to stay out of the room. There's nothing but air blocking me. So I'm practicing some self-restraint and self-control. That, that'll help Molly next time. She's like, well, you know, the sky's over there getting some pets. I'm going to go shove myself between them. No, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to I'm going to practice a little self-restraint, self-control. Right now, they don't have to. They just do whatever's instinctive to them. And now we got to the point where now Sky is starting to go back uh, after Molly. Um, and Sky's not that much smaller than Molly is. And so this is just a, these are problems that are somewhat related to this. Um, I don't. That's why I'd also strongly recommend no more people food. Um, if you do want to give it to them, make sure you give it to them the next day. Um, so it doesn't smell, and it's nowhere near your meal, it's almost a surprise, and they, they get it in the bowl. Uh, but if you want, you can just order some dog treats and dog jerky and different stuff like that and give them that instead of the people food. Uh, just It's going to create problems, especially with the grandkids. Um, okay, so um, look for other rules. There's probably other rules that you can incorporate. Um, no being alone, the furniture is one of them. Um, and the gardens kind of already practiced that a little bit. Um, now, if you are having difficulty getting them to stay off the furniture, those X mats, the letter X, M A T S, you can get on Amazon or Chewy, will do the trick. Um, and that might also do the trick for you on your, uh, the, uh, uh, get for Molly getting up on the actual bed. Uh, remember to practice that out command that I have in the video above, and you can do the same thing for the bed. So if Molly gets in the bed, throw a treat off the bed. When she runs off the bed and gets it off, maybe when she licks it up, we say the word uh, off instead of out. Or uh, so she has a, di a distinction, and so then she jumps back up, throw another treat down. Now eventually it gets to the point where I jump up on the couch to get the treat. So what we would do is I just throw it on the ground the first couple times. After that, then I tell the dog down, and when the dog complies, then I pay the dog afterwards. And remember, the treat goes in the mouth, and they hear the word after. Um, all right, let me see what else do we talk about. Um, petting with a purpose and passive training are going to be huge for the you guys uh, for these particular dogs. So petting with a purpose. Molly comes up and invades people's space, and our guardians just dutifully pet her every time she did. So the invading space is how I ask for attention. And she'll climb up on top of you, and she puts her paws on top of you. Nothing wrong with her paws being on top of me if I ask for it, but she's doing it right now when you don't ask for it. And she invades people's personal space, and I think he was jo jokingly said, the guardian said jokingly that she's ruined some friends, but there's some people who probably don't want to come over because of her lack of boundaries. The video above will help with that, but you have to make sure that you are cognizant. It's not that you don't mind that she does it. The key factor is, did you give her permission or invite her to do it? If not, then it's inappropriate for her to do it because whatever she does with you, she thinks she can do with everybody. And again, she can be intimidating for some people. So when you uh, practice eating, practice having a snack, sitting in different chairs in the house, and then the other person can enforce the boundary for you. And when your grandkids come over, have them practice sitting in different chairs around the house. So that way you get to practice enforcing those rules and demonstrate that you are a leader through your actions. Um, now, leaders tell, followers ask. So if the dog comes over and nudges me, it's telling me, pet me, give me attention, damn it. And if I pet the dog, I'm saying, yes, you're my boss, because when you tell me to jump, I say, how high? So instead, next time that Molly comes over and invades your personal space, give her a counter order, or nudges you, or whatever it is. Tell her to lay down for Molly, to hold, uh, uh, for Sky to tell her to sit, one time. Let's say Molly's already sitting here. Ask her to come and sit over here or lie down. She has to do something to change her state based on your directive. If she, she does it within three seconds, put her under her chin and say sit or down or whatever your command word is. And put her as much or as little as you want. If you tell her sit and she doesn't sit, playing hard to give works great for dating, works great for dogs. So you say sit, one, two, three, I count my head, she doesn't sit by three. I lean back, pull out my phone, grab a drink, you know, do something else, show the dog, I've got other things to do. After that, that makes your pets more valuable. And if they're more valuable, the dog's more inclined to want to listen to you. 
So what we're telling the dogs is you can't tell the humans what to do anymore. You have to ask, and better than ask, you have to pay for the privilege of their attention. And you pay for it through a currency of obedience. So what will happen is the dogs start coming and sitting in front of you to prepay for that attention. When they do, make sure you pet them and say at least a little bit. Otherwise, they'll go back to nudging you or pawing at them. Now, if they do it and then you pet them and they come back and do it again and they pet them and they do it again and they pet them uh, when they're sitting for it, well, the dog's saying, I need some exercise. So that's a good time to go to the stairs. Remember, if they're naughty, um, rambunctious, you should interpret that as the dog needs some exercise. Okay, um, so um, remember to use the watchword of paycheck. Paycheck means I suspect you forgot to pet with purpose. So if somebody comes in, I'm petting Molly, and Molly's standing, they say paycheck, even if I did it right, I would stop petting Molly, tell Molly to down. When Molly downs, I pet her on her shin, say down, say actually I asked her to down. When you open the door, she stood up and I continued petting her, but thank you because I do forget to pet without a purpose. Even if I want to pet Molly, or if you want to pet Molly or Sky, you should still tell them to sit. If they don't sit, they don't get the privilege of your attention. Again, that will concentrate and make it more valuable. If you get in the habit of petting with a purpose, and that's really what it is, petting your dog for a reason, Every time you pet your dog, it increases their respect for you as an authority figure. It boosts the dog's self-esteem or confidence because it's earning the affection versus getting it for being a good looking dog. And number three, it helps them practice sitting. If we want to practice doing something in a hard situation, we practice an easier version earlier, uh, or e an easier version first. And so if I want my dog to sit when delivery drivers will come, there's no way they're gonna do it unless I can get it to sit when there's nobody in the living room. So uh, the more that you practice petting with a purpose, it truly becomes a gift. You won't even think about it. I'm going to show you a little trick on how to get a dog to sit. Sky. So I hold my hand with a cup and I go an arc over the head. And then when they sit, I lower and let it lick the treat off my hand and I tickle under their chin. Not always going to give a treat. Come. Um, and so this way, that hand motion is a good way to put the dog in a sit. And then if they get used to always getting that tickle under the chin, when you don't get a treat, at least they get a little bit of a tickle. Now I also talked about passive training. Passive training is a form of operant conditioning. What it is is basically recognizing, and I actually just did it here with Molly. I didn't ask Molly to come, but when she came, I petted her and gave her a treat. So um, a lot of times when we give our dogs commands, it represents the end of fun. I'm in the backyard yelling at the, at the golfers, and then you don't want the golfers to hear it, so you ask the dog to come. The dog comes and goes inside, and you close the door, and they're like, well, damn, I was having a great time yelling at the golfers. I listened to you, and now the, end, now the fun is over. So a lot of dogs learn not to, give, not to listen because they only give the commands when they're doing things we don't want. So uh, passive training is really celebrating the things the dog does that we do like and celebrating it and demonstrate to our dogs that we like it through our actions. So every time the dog comes to you, as long as they're not invading your personal space, maybe not so much for Molly, but uh, for Skye, every time she comes to you, pet her and say come. Every time she sits down, pet her and say sit. Every time they lay down, pet her and say crash or chill or down or whatever your word is. Um, Molly, let's say I tell Molly to uh, down and she doesn't down here, but she walks over there and she lies down over there. I wouldn't get up and go pet her, but I would say the word down. So I want her to hear the command word when they're in context and doing whatever it is. I usually give a dog a command twice. I'll show you right here with Skye. Skye. Sky, sit, sit. So the first time was telling her what to do, what I refer to as a command stage. The second time was to tell her why I was paying her, in this case, giving her a treat, or it could be giving her affection. So, um, uh, in, and avoid saying the command word over and over again. The guardians here, I've noticed, uh, were, were saying, Molly, down, down, down. Remember, the more you say it, the less you do. So say it once, and then the consequence, if she doesn't do it, she doesn't get your attention. You just go back to doing something else. Now, if she does jump, uh, climb on top of you, standing up is a good way to get her off. And you don't have to go through always standing up. Just go through this process. After a while, she'll just start doing it, getting down on her own. But the key is when she's walking towards you, you know she's going to put her paws here. Give her that hiss before she even gets a chance to pick it up off the ground. Um, speaking of the hiss, we went through the four escalating consequences. We forget what, uh, how to disagree with dogs. If you forget what those are, message me. I'm happy to go over them with you. Now, I'd like you to practice that, uh, that boundary exercise like we in the video above in, like I said, for kids' snacks, kitchen, uh, cooking in the kitchen, eating at the dinner table, and eating at the different parts of the house. Um, we need the dogs to practice some self-restraint or self-control. I'd also like you to make sure that uh, you're doing, not letting, uh, if, you're, if I'm petting Sky, don't let Molly come over and shove her way in there. So, you know, if you have to stand up and make uh, uh, Molly move away and then give Sky that full attention. Uh, I think the biggest, and dogs have different problems for different reasons, but I think Molly just thinks that she's got your wrapped around her fingers because you guys have gotten in some habits that are not necessarily the best. 
petting her at the wrong times, and things along those lines. Well, once you start withholding that affection, petting her, making her earn it, that's gonna boost your self-esteem and confidence, and a lot of dogs that go after other dogs are doing it out of an insecurity. We didn't talk about this in the session, but one of the things I'd like you to do is try to put an onus on trying to teach them some new tricks and commands. Go to YouTube, just look up, you know, easy dog tricks. Maybe it's just teaching a dog, bang, you're dead, and they flop on the ground, or roll over. I wouldn't practice the shake. Um, but, you know, whatever these commands, beg, sit pretty, whatever it is, if you teach them these new tricks and commands, you have different, a number of different things you can do to distract them, number one, but also you boost their self-esteem. Confident people are able to brush things off. Insecure people are the ones that like have a meltdown when something happens to them. So same thing for your dogs. If your dogs are confident because they have a wealth of knowledge and a lot of skills, they carry themselves with a little bit more uh, verve. And so that's gonna help reduce that. And I think uh, I think a lot of Molly's uh, going after uh, Skya's insecurity. And so if we can kind of teach them, well, through our actions, like sitting is a great way to get our attention. And we're exercising them and we're enforcing rules and we're rewarding them when they do uh, give us the, uh, the, the behaviors that we want. All of a sudden the dog's motivation is gonna to be to start doing the things that we want as opposed to the contrast, which is what they're doing basically now. So uh, now the exercise that I showed you here with the, uh, on the deck, you can do the same thing with your front door. So if you, I, I can't remember what the front door area looks like, but if it goes from like wood to tile or something like that, walk towards the dog and you can actually, uh, if you go to my, uh, my website and search for door or claim the door, I've got a bunch of videos that teach the dogs how to stay a 10 foot boundary away from the door when you have guests come up. And it's a real, another great opportunity for the dogs to practice some self-restraint or self-control. Now, a couple of housekeeping things. Remember, anything your dog is doing when you pet is where you're specifically doing, including unbalanced states of mind. Pet a fearful dog, you make it more fearful, stressed, more stress, aggressive, more aggressive, barky. Excited is probably the most common one. So now, if the dog is in a mouse state of mind, like fear or stress, you can lay your hand on them, and they do associate touch with affection, but as soon as you start petting, you'll reinforce it. So pet, but if the dog is reacting to something, the best thing you do is increase the distance between them and whatever they're reacting to. Um, let me see. Um, anything your dog is doing in presence that you don't specifically disagree with, you're saying that it's my seal of approval. So remember, not saying no is akin to saying yes. Um, uh, any attention is good attention. So avoid chastising the dog. And remember, when Molly is growling, we don't want to disagree with that. Well, we can disagree, but we don't want to correct her for that. So if she's uh, growling at the sky, I might stand up and march towards Molly to make Molly leave the area. So if you growl at sky, then you have to leave. She can leave and turn around and come right back as long as she doesn't growl again. So that's a nice way to have a consequence and you're following through, you're doing it in a way that dogs would understand. But if she's doing it, you just say no. Some dogs learn, just go straight to a bite. And I think and some dogs do it because that's a good way to get your attention. So in this case, you're not getting the attention, you're getting the, per well, I guess you're getting the attention. The person stands up, walks over and makes you walk away. And then the person goes back. So you don't get uh, a reward or validation, but the person does demonstrate, yes, this is important to us. Okay, um, so if you have if you have any questions on any of the stuff that we went over, please text me. If I don't hear from you, I assume everything's going great. A lot of my clients only need to see me once. You guys might need to see have us come back. We might need to come up and work on some things in the house uh, once the coronavirus is done and flesh things out a little bit. But let's give it a month and see how it goes before we cross that bridge. Um, all right, Molly, Sky, come. Sky gets a treat. Come. Sit, sit, Molly, Molly, she's not going to do it. Well, Molly's a great dame. Uh, you saw a little bit of her. This is Sky. Let's show Sky's face because she's such a pretty looking whiny. There we go. And Molly's whining because she wants to go inside. Remember, whining, if it gets you to open the door or you pet or you say we stop, the whining will, do, uh, will re replicate. So if they're whining, you just have to just completely ignore it, barking. And don't even exhale, don't roll your eyes, because all the dogs will recognize all the things it said. Just ignore it completely. All right, well, that was Sky. Molly is over there, and I'm David, and this is their roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.